A discovery has sent shockwaves across the scientific community, deep within the enormous expanse of the Grand Canyon. This is a scary finding that has even the most seasoned researchers wondering what lies ahead. So come together and join us as we reveal the terrifying reality behind this new and startling discovery, and expect to be kept on the edge of your seat. It is hypothesized that the Grand Canyon came into existence between 5 and 6 million years ago as a result of the melting of ice and the accumulation of rainwater throughout the ice ages, which resulted in the formation of a drainage system known as the Colorado River. The power of the river carved its way through the strata of rock, wearing away at it over the course of time to form the steep canyon that we see today. Because of dams and other man-made conditions, the Colorado River is on the verge of running dry. People are conducting research into the past of the Grand Canyon as a result of a recent discovery. The Colorado River is on the verge of drying up, and the Grand Canyon condors once fed on creatures that are no longer around to provide food for them. This could have led to the bird's extinction. The Colorado River begins its journey in the Rocky Mountains and winds its way through canyons, deserts, and waterfalls on its route to the Grand Canyon. From there, it enters the Gulf of California after passing through the Grand Canyon. Researchers have discovered that if certain measures are not implemented, the river will run dry in a relatively short amount of time. The construction of dams and changes in the Colorado River's course are two human activities that environmentalists believe have degraded the river's quality of life. The flow of the river through the Grand Canyon is as strong as ever, although the current water level is far lower than it was in the past. Environmentalists believe that dams and the redirection of rivers are the primary causes of this which is why individuals who are interested in going whitewater rafting in the Grand Canyon should do so as soon as possible. The Grand Canyon is a very large canyon and is regarded as one of the seven natural wonders of the world, and the steep canyon walls that surround it conceal discoveries that have the potential to reveal long-forgotten truths about the past. An elite group of paleontologists from all around the world has banded together to investigate some significant fossil footprints that were just recently found in a remote area of Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. Trackways of primitive tetrapods, animals that walk on four legs, have lived in an ancient desert environment, have been found inside a big sandstone boulder that has been extraordinarily well preserved. The fossilized footprints have been dated to almost the beginning of the Permian period, which is 280 million years ago. This is before the first dinosaurs appeared on the scene. The first scientific study reporting fossil tracks from the Grand Canyon was published in 1918, just one year prior to the park being founded as a section of the National Park Service. The article was written by a team of researchers from the U.S. and Great Britain. The Grand Canyon National Park is celebrating its centennial this year, and as part of the festivities, fresh findings from the study conducted on ancient footprints found in the area are being presented in a scientific journal that came out this week. Dr. Hytor Francischini, a Brazilian paleontologist who works at the Laboratory of Vertebrate Paleontology at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, is the primary author of the recent paper. He collaborated on the study with researchers from Germany and the U.S. In 2017, Francischini and Dr. Spencer Lewis, curator of paleontology at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science in Albuquerque, New Mexico, made their first trip to the Grand Canyon fossil track locality. They were accompanied by other scientists. The paleontologists immediately identified that the fossil tracks were formed by a long-extinct relative of very early reptiles. The fossil traces were comparable to tracks known from Europe and referred to as Ichneotherium. This is the first time that Ichneotherium has been found in the Coconino sandstone and in a desert environment, and the discovery was made at the Grand Canyon. In addition, the geological age of these tracks makes them the youngest example of this particular form of fossil trail ever found elsewhere in the globe. Ichneotherium is a type of footprint that scientists believe was left behind by a mysterious group of extinct tetrapods known as diadectomorphs. The diadectomorphs were an ancient group of tetrapods that shared traits with both amphibians and reptiles. They came from the time before the dinosaurs. In a field of vertebrate paleontology, Important and unsolved problems concerning the evolutionary relationships of diadectomorphs, as well as their paleobiology, have persisted for a very long time. Although it's possible that the animal that left the footprints in the Grand Canyon may never be identified with absolute certainty, 
the trackways in the Grand Canyon preserve the journey of an extremely ancient terrestrial vertebrate. A prehistoric animal with short legs and a big body is suggested by the quantifiable properties of the tracks and trackways. The creature walked using all four of its legs, and each foot had five fingers that did not have claws. The geological formation in which the newly discovered fossil tracks in the Grand Canyon were preserved is another noteworthy component of these traces. The Coconino sandstone is an aeolian wind-deposited rock formation that displays cross-bedding and other sedimentary features that indicate it was deposited in a desert or dune environment. These features indicate that the Coconino sandstone was formed. Because of this, the discovery of Ichnotherium in the Coconino sandstone represents the earliest evidence of diadectomorphs inhabiting a dry and arid environment. These new fossil tracks discovered in Grand Canyon National Park provide crucial information regarding the paleobiology of the diadectomorphs, said Franciscini, who led the expedition that discovered the tracks. It was presumed that the diadectomorphs did not have the typical adaptations necessary to survive in an environment that lacked access to water and hence was not likely that they could have survived in a dry desert environment. There is a class of animals known as amniota, which includes extinct reptiles, birds, and mammals. However, diadectomorphs is not a member of this class. In addition to this, Lucas mentions that paleontologists have long believed that only amniotes could exist in the dry and severe Permian deserts. This discovery demonstrates that there were other types of tetrapods besides reptiles living in those deserts, and unexpectedly, they were already accustomed to living in an environment with minimal water. In 2019, in honor of the Grand Canyon National Park Centennial, which will be commemorated with the hashtag Grand Canyon 100, the National Park Service will be conducting an exhaustive survey of the paleontological resources found inside the park. A distinguished team of specialists in geology and paleontology will participate in fieldwork and research to help expand our understanding of the rich fossil record preserved at Grand Canyon National Park, said senior paleontologist Vincent Santucci of the National Park Service. This will help us expand our understanding of the Grand Canyon's rich fossil record. In Grand Canyon National Park, a paleontological study has shown that a sequence of recently found fossil tracks are the oldest reported traces of their sort to date. These tracks were discovered in the past few years. Alan Krill, a professor of geology at the University of Oslo in Norway, was out hiking with his students in 2016 when he found an unexpected find. A boulder that was lying next to the trail and was in full view of the many hikers featured prominent fossil footprints on its surface. Stephen Rowland, a paleontologist at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, received a snapshot from Krill, who was so intrigued by the find that he forwarded it to Rowland. The tracks that were found along the trail side turned out to be even more crucial for Krill than he had initially anticipated. According to Rowland, they are by far the oldest vertebrate tracks in Grand Canyon, which is famed for its rich fossil tracks. These are by far the oldest vertebrate tracks in Grand Canyon. More crucially, he noted, they are among the oldest tracks on Earth of shell-egg-laying creatures, such as reptiles, which means that they represent the earliest evidence of vertebrate animals walking through sand dunes. The rock that contained the trace fell from an outcrop of the Manakasha Formation that was located nearby. The presence of a detailed geologic map of the strata along the Bright Angel Trail, in conjunction with previous studies of the age of the Manakasha Formation, enabled the researchers to pin down the age of the tracks quite precisely to be 313 million years old, with a margin of error of 0.5 million years. On the downward slope of a sand dune, the freshly uncovered tracks record the passage of not one, but two different kinds of animals. The particular configuration of footprints is something that the study team is interested in. The reconstruction of this animal's footfall sequence by the researchers reveals a distinctive gait known as a lateral sequence walk. This gait is characterized by the movement of the legs on one side of the animal moving in succession, the rear leg followed by the foreleg alternating with the movement of the two legs on the opposite side of the animal. According to Roland, living species of tetrapods, including dogs and cats, for example, commonly utilize a lateral sequence gait when they travel slowly. The traces on the Bright Angel Trail provide evidence that this manner of walking was used very early on in the evolution of vertebrate creatures. Before this, we did not have any knowledge of that. The trackways have also shed light on the earliest known use of sand dunes by creatures with backbones, which was previously unknown. 
Let's also talk a bit about the history of the Grand Canyon. When the first evidence of the human presence in the area was discovered, which was 10,500 years ago, the beginning of the known human history of the area surrounding the Grand Canyon began. The Colorado River, according to the hypothesis of many researchers in the field of science, carved out the Grand Canyon over a period of millions of years. The river's course was redirected as a result of the formation of the Kaibab Plateau, which occurred along the river's path of travel. The river began to flow in two different directions, with one branch eventually emptying into the Gulf of Mexico and the other branch eventually becoming a massive lake. After a long period of time, the lake evaporated, leaving behind the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon did not come into existence as a result of a single historical event, but rather over a period of millions and millions of years. According to the opinions of various scientists and geologists, there was no canyon in that region around 35 million years ago. The Colorado River wound its way through a wide-open landscape. During this same period of time, the Kaibab Plateau began to materialize in the exact center of where the river was flowing. The channel of the river was redirected since it was impossible for the water to flow over or through the plateau. The Grand Canyon in Arizona, located in the U.S., is a well-known tourist site that displays an incredible geological timeline of the planet that extends back millions of years. The Colorado River flows through the canyon, which is located in Arizona. It is an amazing example of the artistic work that nature does not only on the surface of the earth, but also beneath it. It is one of the most popular tourist spots in the U.S. due to the fact that its enormous canyon receives monthly visits from thousands of people. Let's take a more in-depth look at the process that created the Grand Canyon, a trip that will take one billion years. The rocks that make up the Grand Canyon were not sculpted into the magnificent forms and curves that we see today by a single historical event. Rather, the formation of the canyon took place over the span of millions of years. There was no canyon in that region almost 35 million years ago, but scientists have not been able to establish a concrete theory regarding the timeline of the formation of the Grand Canyon. This is despite the fact that scientists have been able to establish a theory regarding the formation of the Grand Canyon. The Colorado River wound its way through an expansive grassland. Its course today is quite similar to the one that existed millions of years ago, but it happens quite a bit lower. During this same period of time, the Kebab Plateau began to materialize in the exact center of where the river was flowing. The channel of the river was redirected since it was impossible for the water to flow over or through the plateau. The Alteration of the Course of the Colorado River In reality, the river forked into two distinct branches. The portion of the river that was located on the right side of the plateau, see the image below, was re-roded in a southeasterly direction and started flowing into the Gulf of Mexico rather than into the Pacific Ocean, which was where it flowed previously before the Kaibab Plateau began rising. The portion of the river that was on the left continued to function as a drainage system for both the plateau and the areas that were located to the west of it. The flow of water in the eastern portion of the river eventually became obstructed around 12 million years ago, which led to the formation of a massive lake. This lake was formed because there was no exit for the water, so it continued to collect. Lake Bitahachi is the name of this body of water. Erosion steps in. Even the hardest rocks eventually succumb to the relentless weathering of their surface, which in turn leads to erosion caused by a variety of factors. A phenomenon referred to as headwater erosion was responsible for the weakening of the western flank of the Kaibab Plateau at the base of the plateau, which is where the river was in continuous contact with it. As a result of the continuation of this process, the foundation of the plateau gradually grew less stable as more time passed. In the end, it gave way, and water was able to break through the barrier that had been established by the Kaibab Plateau and return to the route that the ancient Colorado River had taken before it was diverted. As a consequence of this, the river took a new path which was relatively comparable to the one it had taken in the past as a result of the favorable terrestrial conditions, and Lake Bitahachi lost a significant amount of its water. The lake was drained by the river's path, which resulted in the development of a gorge through which the Colorado River continues to flow to this day. When these two branches of the Colorado River came together, the river's flow became more expansive and more profound, and lo and behold, the Grand Canyon came into being. The Little Colorado River drainage system moved in and took up residence in the area that was formerly inhabited by Lake Bitahachi before it dried up. This is merely a high-level overview of the process that took millions of years, 
was driven by changes in the environment and erosion and resulted in the development of the Grand Canyon. Volcanism, continental drift, and even minute shifts in the Earth's orbit all contributed in some way to the overall outcome of this process. There were also a great number of additional elements that were involved which in turn causes variations in seasons and climate. Hence, the next time you find yourself staring in awe at this spectacular piece of natural beauty, keep in mind that you are not simply witnessing a massive building, but rather millions of years of Mother Nature at her most creative. According to the opinions of various specialists, uranium mining in the Grand Canyon can be hazardous to people. It is true that the Grand Canyon contains uranium, but the level of radiation there is quite low, so it is perfectly fine for anyone to go there. But there are abandoned mines in the Grand Canyon that present a risk to people who choose to make their home there. When the uranium rush began again, people headed back to the Grand Canyon region to begin mining once more. However, for the previous 20 years, uranium mining had been prohibited on one million acres of land surrounding the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon's Havasupai people were removed from their land against their will. Those who have lived in the area now known as the Havasupai tribe have called the Grand Canyon home for a very long time. They inhabit a broad region that may be found to the east of the Bill Williams mountain range and all the way down to the tiny Colorado River. On the Colorado Plateau, to the east of the Moen Kopi Wash and quite a distance from the Grand Canyon was where the Supai people lived. They did not see any European explorers until the late 1800s when they arrived at the canyon and followed the road formed by the Hopi Havasupai and ancient Puebloans. Prior to that time, they were the only people in the area. The Havasupai were relocated to a reservation in Havasu Canyon that included a total area of 518 acres after being ordered to leave by the National Park Service. In 1975, the federal government granted the Supai tribe ownership of 185,000 acres of land within the canyon as well as along the rim of the canyon. The members of the tribe today make their living through farming, tourism, and paid jobs. The Ruins Museum in Tucson displays artifacts from a town that dates back 12,000 years in Arizona. The Tucson Ruins may be at a distance of three miles to the west of Desert Viewpoint, which is the location of the Grand Canyon's most eastern entrance. The museum and the ruins themselves are the two components that make up the whole. Visitors are able to gain a deeper understanding of the historical site by perusing the various displays that are located close to the ruins of the old village. More than 12,000 years have passed since people first settled in the area that is now known as the Grand Canyon, and the archaeological work housed in the Tucson Ruins Museum is the most comprehensive of its kind in the region. Mogollon Monster Spotted in the Grand Canyon The odd characteristics of the creature sighted there A mysterious creature known as the Mogollon Monster has been reported in the area surrounding the Grand Canyon. The first sighting of the Mogollon monster was made in 1903 by a man named I.W. Stevens. He described the creature as having a long white beard and white hair on its head. It is stated that the Mogollon monster stands seven feet tall, has hair that can be either black or reddish in color, and does not have a face, chest, feet, or hands. In addition to that, it has enormous feet that leave footprints that are roughly 22 inches long, and it has a putrid odor. The majority of campers and hikers in the region said that the Mogollon monster would visit their campsites at night and take care of any problems that arose on its own. There have been reports of individuals hearing extended whistles and knocking sounds coming from the woods. After four decades, the suite that John F. Kennedy stayed in while visiting the Grand Canyon is still there. The underground suite in the Grand Canyon Caves is cared for and maintained by the Above Ground Caverns Motel, which is located above ground. It is in this location that John F. Kennedy's emergency supplies, which are 40 years old now, are preserved and can still be used. This brand new suite in the Grand Canyon is situated 220 feet below the surface, is equipped with a record player and running water, and can be rented out for $900 per night due to the unique history of the location. So that's all for the video today. We will be right back with more. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more. Thanks for watching.